when you work on the product areas, you make it as usable as possible. You don't think about money at all. You think about how can I make sure that they will use it in the most, in the best possible way. In order to create consistent copy, we need to use, first of all, design principles. What is the user journey? How we can communicate our product in the whole user journey from getting that lead to onboarding them to make them use the product. You want people to feel comfortable and confident using your products and services, and you want to build trust. And once you do that, you'll see that they hooked and they will use your products and services for a very long time, for many years, forever, arguably. Mm -hmm. Some companies, you just pay them forever. And that's the best, the best business to be in. Hey, welcome to the Message Market Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Silvestri. And if you're new here, this is a show where I chat with B2B SaaS folks in marketing, product, growth, and founders about how they join the conversation already happening in their customers' minds. We dive deep into their thinking, their systems, and their playbooks to see how they empathize with their audience and speak to them in a way that resonates. So they're compelled to take action. Join us and learn how you too can shape your messaging strategy and write copy that truly resonates and differentiates you. I'm super excited about my guest today, Yuval Kescher. Yuval is the founder and CEO of UX Writing Hub, a platform that provides training and agency services for UX writing and content design. In this episode, we chat about Yuval's journey from graphic design to UX writing and how his sales background still informs his approach to UX. We also dive into the importance of UX writing for retention and reducing churn, strategies of creating consistent copy across touchpoints, and his thoughts on the future of UX writing with AI. Let's dive right in. Hey Yuval, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Awesome. So I'm really excited about this conversation because UX writing, it's something I think still quite niche, but super important, especially if like for product SaaS and you built an entire business, like coaching, mentoring business around it. I'm curious first about how did you land there? What brought you there? I know that you started in, you had a career in graphic design as well. Can you walk us through the, the main milestones? Yes, yeah, so I downloaded Photoshop when I was 14, hacked it, saw so Adobe, it was, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, and uh, it was the first days of the internet, and I was fascinated by creating visual stuff for online. I actually had a medical issue with my hands and my shoulders that it was very difficult for me to do create what I have here in my head. Okay. Mm. And for the first time ever, when I was like 14 years old, I was able to taking what I have in my head and put it in like a canvas to this day. When I write also, I write only in word or Google docs, and that's my best way to communicate myself because my handwriting is just terrible, like the worst you could imagine. And it actually hurts me to write. Oh. And so that was an epiphany moment for me that that working on a computer is actually something that I'm doing quite well. Uh, and uh, me thinking and doing something in front of a computer is a positive experience for me. And time went by, I did all kinds of crazy stuff afterward, including, I don't know, being in the special forces of the army to mm -hmm. traveling the world, going to Thailand, meeting there someone, traveling all over the world with her, getting married in New York, being a realtor then selling, being a salesperson of different products. It was crazy times. And during my time as a salesperson, I was working at different malls in Canada and the US. And I could, I noticed I'm a good salesperson and I could sell anything basically. And I thought to myself, how about maybe I should try to sell what, why? Because I, I was working in a mall. It was like maybe 2011 or 2012. And Facebook pages became a thing and websites were bigger than it used to be and mobile websites too. And I noticed that nobody's on mobile. Nobody have a Facebook page in that random mall in, in Canada. And I was like, let's try to sell a service of 
a website. So if I could, I don't know, if I could sell a cream or I don't know where renting a flat, I could probably sell a website too. Why not? There is a demand for that. Why there, there isn't any reason I couldn't sell it. The only problem is that I didn't know how to build a website. So I first sold the service. Later, I had to figure out how to build websites. So nice. then I got into WordPress for the first time. And that was a lifesaver because I managed to manipulate different templates and building website. So that's how I started my career as a web builder, basically, not yeah. the developer because I don't know how to code. And that's how the rest of my career looked like. Me figuring out how to do stuff for digital experiences and writing content about it and so on. I did different type of evolutions in my career, went into graphic design again, then a, a UX design. I wrote a lot about UX design at some point on Medium. I got some traction like for my work, managed to get some really interesting projects. Then I noticed on the product teams I were working on, uh, I, I just combined two of my skills, which are writing and design. Nobody on my design team were able to communicate the digital experience at all. So let's say I'm building right now UI for uh, an app for teachers that helping them to teach music. So we didn't have writer in the team, but we still had to communicate those experiences. So we wanted to hire a writer and we didn't had a single writer that we wanted to hire that understood design principles. So then I just dived into the world of the combination of design principles and writing. At some point in 2017, Google brought on stage three people and they said, we are UX writers. We are the people that combine design principles and writing. And this is how we do it. And that moment was life changing for me because I was like, oh, so they name it. That's how we, they do it. That's great. When Google did it at some point, I already had a community of maybe 5,000 people yeah. that were interested in that topic. And it just grew and grew. And all I did was creating content for that community, building a know-how, helping people to get into the field in case they were interested, helping more companies to understand why they should invest in UX writing in the first place. And then after doing that market education, helping them also to recruit. So today I wear, I'm wearing two different hats, which is doing UX writing projects for companies and doing UX writing training for people that want to get into the field. And building a community, now it's 2024 already, around 100,000 people in the community overall. Today, some people call it content design. So know yeah. that if you're looking for UX writing, you can also look for content design. Different companies call it in different names. And that's more or less about my evolution and my career. Wow, well, well, lots of things to touch on. First, I'm interested in, in your background as a salesperson, because a lot of writers are super introvert people and they despise sales and everything and like getting on calls. So I'm curious about what lessons did you take from your sales background into the, the writing that you do now? Everything. Being a sales, I'm also, I'm, a, I'm not an introvert and not an extrovert. I'm a mixtrovert, right? Yeah. So <laughs> in some scenarios, I'm very shy and don't want to see humans. Get a fuck out of my vision right now. I can't. Like I have ADHD, probably some people understood it already based on all of the things I'm yeah. spitting, all of the content I'm spitting, but sometimes I just don't want anyone to talk to me. And sometimes I just, I want to be on stage and want that my work would be acknowledged by hundreds of people. So I'm always in that spectrum, which yeah. is a big spectrum. And for me, working in sales was just cool because I think that every person should know how to do sales because at the end of the day, we're doing business. It doesn't matter if you are the owner of the business or it doesn't matter if you work it. A business would hire you and keep paying you only if you move the needed in a positive direction to, to the finance of that organization. It means that if yeah. you're doing, for example, marketing for something, you need to have KPIs and increase the leads that end up leading to sales that end up to living to revenue for that company. If your writing doesn't create any leads, that means it goes down and then less sales, less revenue, they can't hire you anymore. So we need to understand businesses in the most fundamental way in order to succeed in business. And sales is one of the most important things. We need to sell ourselves all the time. In a job interview, we're making a sale. 
when we write a converting email, we're making a sale. When we try to attract lead, we're making a sale. So we're always selling something. And working in sales was a great score for me. And first thing it taught me is how to get rejected. Yeah. Because as a salesperson, like when you properly work at sales, you get rejected all the time. People are like, get the fuck out. We don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want what you're doing right now. Get out. And I was working in a mall and I was trying to actually sell creams. Okay. That's what I do at the beginning. I was very young and I was trying to sell creams. I needed the money and nobody wanted cream. And some people wanted creams and that people, those people actually created my payroll because I was making a commission, uh, but 95% of the people didn't want anything with those creams. So the first lesson was how to get a no and to understand that the no is not personal. So I wasn't offended. And at the beginning I was like, oh, I'm a failure. They don't want what I sell. Destroy. I'm a failure. No. So yeah, destroyed from the inside. <laughs> and then slowly, but steady, like you're building your confidence and your character and you understand that every no the cliche, but every no get you to the next yes. And that's mm -hmm. basically what you're looking for. You can have 50 fail, but one success, and that's the one you're looking for. The one that gives you the sale. So it doesn't matter if I had 100 no, I got a very successful sale in the 101. That's great. I'm happy mm -hmm. with it. That was a good score for me. Yeah. And the fact that I walked in that mall and I thought to myself, wait, if I could make a sale for cream, could probably make a sale for something that other people need in other industries. And doing this uh, change made me realize that the feel, the, the concept of making a sale is duplicatable. So you could, doesn't matter what are you trying to sell. If you do it well, you could sell everything, basically your services as a UX designer, your services in email marketing and your business product to your clients, it doesn't really matter. As long as you understand the concept, obviously every sales goal have, or every sale sell different context based on what are you trying to sell. And you need to learn that. You need to know the script yeah. or whatever, the sales script, but the concepts are similar, which are, uh, and listen to that person, see what, where are their pains uh, and understand how you could help them if it's like with the cream. So maybe they have a low self-esteem and they have some like a rosacea on their face and now they want to fix it. And you can come up with a solution for that. You're not going to try to sell them an eye serum if they have rosacea. <laughs> so the same goes with web development and websites. Someone have pain or not getting leads through, and this is like a 15 years old lesson, but someone want to get lead from a Facebook page or a website. They don't have any online presence. Um, and you can make a sale easily by, by showing them how you can get them. Yeah. That's about it. Nice. Yeah. I think any freelancer should heed these words and double down and try to get a bit more uncomfortable as well, just because I think once you start getting into it, those are skills that compound that. And even I think in your personal life, it's good to be a good sales person. You know, you have to sell your own personal brand, right? Yeah. Your personal life with your relationship. Also when finding the right partner, you're also making a sale in a way you want to yeah. sell yourself as a good exactly. partner and, and being a good salesperson give you that. What I learned during the years um, is that sales are getting harder and harder because people try to sell you stuff all the time, especially these days when you have basically all of your social media feed is filled with commercial that some of them are very visible, like ads. Some of them are not visible. Some of them like show up, you're following this person for six months and then they make a sale and then you're like, oh, I'm going to get it. So, uh, today's sales process is a bit different if you ask me. It's more about delivering uh, another cliche, but it's all about delivering uh, value first consistently for a while, building trust and making a sale when appropriate. And that's, that's a positive thing. I believe you build trust with your client base. That's what we did with the expanding hub. Didn't 
didn't get paid for three years, to be honest, building the community, sharing insights from my client work, sharing insights from interviews I'm doing, basically scratching the end of the internet to find interesting case studies and sharing them with the community. People appreciated that. And when I started the UX Writing Hub and launched the courses that we still run today, we had already a client base and that helped me to launch my first business, my first successful business. I had maybe 10 failed business before, before that. Nice. So we talked yeah. about delivering value, solving problems. So I was wondering in your own words, what problems do you solve with the UX Writing Hub and who is it for specifically? So two main problems. Uh, one is for people that need training in UX writing. So just like any bootcamp out there, like developers bootcamp and design bootcamps, the data and information and know-hows and knowledge exist in the internet. I didn't invent anything. What my program offers is an accelerated process to this field. So instead of spending like one year or two years just to figuring out by yourself as an autodidact, you can actually in six months get a mentor that will give you feedback on assignment that you submit to them. So that gives you some hands-on experience. You get to work with a cohort of like-minded people. So we have weekly workshops that we run to these students. So you learn how to give feedback and get feedback and do work with the team of writers and work with a product manager, which is me for the sake of the workshop. And, and, and a lot of interesting stuff that you get during the program. In addition to that, people also get to work on a real industry project during the pro program. So that gives them like an actual hands-on experience that helps them to find a job by the end of the program. So that's the value that we give to the people that want to get into the field. And uh, then we give also value to companies that need to have this operation in, tra in, in place. So good old agency work, a bank or a big company want to have UX writer or some UX writing, they hire us, we budget for it. We give them maybe a bank of hours or a monthly retainer or something like that. And we help them to move the needle and to add an external outsourced UX writer to their team. And in the last couple of years, we had a big growth in the agency operation because more people were laying off full-time UX writers and UX designers, but in the same time, they got into UX content debt. So they still need to have it, but they, but they didn't have any person that was actually doing that. So instead of hiring someone full-time, paying them above, six, above the six figures, they decided to have us with a flexible hourly bank where they could just hire us as much as they needed. Most of the time they understand that they need more and more. And then we start them maybe two or three or four writers, helping them to set up their whole UX writing operation horizontally in the company. Yeah. So that's the, what we give to, to the UX writing agency clients. In addition to that, I have a few more personal passion. One passion is a uh, no code and building marketing and business operation. So I'm always in the lookout at the UX writing hub. How can I automate everything mm. around what I do? So the way we manage the mentors and the students, it's through an app that I've built with a no code operation, like connecting just different databases to different automation and different LMSs. And that was quite interesting. And the way I manage all of the clients of the building hub is also with the, a lot of automation that I've built. And uh, yeah, I truly believe that people that automate and learning that as well could maybe 10 X their revenue and delegate stuff or automate stuff that is repeatable. Yeah. And that's another passion of mine. I'm working on another program that is not related to the UX writing hub where, where I plan to teach that specifically. I don't have any marketing materials for that yet, but just a personal passion. I don't think that I will even want to profit that much out of it because I think doing projects for companies would, would generate more money, uh -huh. but as a passionate project, I might have maybe 10 people that I will mentor personally, teaching them exactly how I do that kind of stuff, but not planning to launch that anytime. So that's another passion. And, and 
And another passion in addition to that is obviously AI. So mm -hmm. teaching how I could use AI into these automations. This goes together with automations, but how can I use AI in my unit writing process, in my project management process, or AI, obviously I'm also on the lookout on all, all of the changes that are happening there because it impacts on all of the different industries. It's also impact the UX writing and content design industry. We are, for example, building AI products. So how, what will be the know-hows right now, design know-how to do UX writing for an AI product. So that's also stuff that I'm experimenting and learning. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm very passionate nice about story. what I do and I'm doing many things. Very busy. Yeah. So you mentioned before we mentioned how writing is tied to revenue and as a conversion copywriter, I love it because it's like, it's a very clear, it's a very clear path, like with conversion copy and sales, revenue conversions. But when it comes to UX writing, how did you link the UX writing work and, and content design to actual revenue and conversion? Because I, that's a little bit more about usability. So how would you tell people? Yeah, how that works. And say that, okay, I have three different branches I want to go for. So the first branch is the easiest one. That's uh, the branch with the low hanging fruit. And that's where UX writing and, and marketing have some overlap. Let me give you an example. PLG, product led grow. That part of product marketing, right? But sometimes when working on a user flow for my clients, I noted because I'm a UX writer that I have an opportunity to make an upsell or a cost. This is a good opportunity for me to, let's say I'm working on a CRM like HubSpot, and this is a good opportunity for me to ask that person to join or to upgrade themselves to one more thing. Maybe instead of just doing, just having HubSpot marketing, now we can have them to use HubSpot sales. So I'm asking them, Hey, what's up? Like, I see that you use HubSpot for this and that. Have you considered HubSpot sale? And then try to make an upsell that I know that the team at, at HubSpot, the content designer are doing a fantastic job. HubSpot is a great company with great UX writing, PLG mm -hmm. and content design. So that's one way to increase conversions inside of the product. That's the low hanging fruit. The other two branches that are a bit more important if you ask me and are dedicated only to the UX writer without an overlap with marketing, those would be the aspect of retention and churn. Let's say that you are using a banking app right now and you want to request a loan through the app. You don't want to talk to people. You want everything to be online instead of serve, no touch. And you look it up and you can't find it because the navigation is not clear. The communication is not clear and everything is in there. A loan for a bank means that the bank makes more money. So a loan is good for business. And if a customer of the bank can't request a loan, that's bad for business. So I can't seem to find it. And then I probably will sign up to another bank with another app that will give me this option to request a loan fast. Very general example, but mm -hmm. bear with me. Retention wise, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be part of the retention of this banking app because I will look this service in another way. So if I had good UX writing in place and good communication in place, I will use this app again and again to request a loan whenever I need a loan. And then I would probably use it to other things like, I don't know, buying some stocks and just good UX writing is good for retention. That's one. And now bad UX writing, let's say that you use right now Hub, not HubSpot, another CRM software, and you're trying to make something, some kind of a, an action. And it's very complicated. You're not sure how to do it. Um, and there is another CRM that gives you the option to do it very quickly, very easily. So what you will do probably, you will unsubscribe for, from the service that is complicated or doesn't make any sense or buggy. Uh, and I'm simplified because it's not that easy to move to another yeah. CRM. Uh, uh, and you will sign up to a service that is a bit, a bit more friendly. 
uh, if it will be cost effective and make sense for you. Uh, or at least you will use the first opportunity you'll ever have to do that. That means that when you have good bad UX writing, you have churn. People are leaving and stop paying for your product and services. Now, this is the funny part. So the way that marketing people sometimes try to fight churn is ridiculous. Can you think about maybe an example of a ridiculous way for a marketing person to fight churn? I don't know, probably discounts. That's not a ridiculous one. That's, I think, one is a positive one. It's a good one. Mm -hmm. But you have those marketing people, and sometimes it's UX people too, that make it very hard to unsubscribe from a service. Uh, okay. So yeah. let me give you an example. I was, my, I, I was once subscribed to a very popular publisher, like a news, a news publisher, very popular one, the, one of the most popular one in the US. And I wanted to unsubscribe at some point. I started they charging me and I barely read their blog posts and their articles and I want to unsubscribe. So I went to my admin one and I looked it up and I couldn't find it. And I keep looking and kept looking and I sent emails and so on. And I understood after only a few days, and by the way, I'm a busy person to say ADHD, I don't have my attention span to God. that for a while. So if I forget yeah. to do it, then I will keep paying for six months or something mm. like that. So if I want that to happen, it will have to happen now. And then they were like, through email, they were like, if you want to unsubscribe, you have to call us. Oh and the only thing is that they are in the US, I'm in it. Tel Aviv right now, and I don't have an American phone number. So they made it like a ridiculous experience for me to unsubscribe from them. And that's a very negative way to fight churn. If someone wants to leave your products and services, just let them. Mm -hmm. You need to make it very accessible, very easy. Hey, you want to unsubscribe? You want to cancel your, your service? No worries. Take your money. Your money is not needed here. The fact that we have SaaS and subscriptions and stuff like that, doesn't mean we need to like milk money from people without them noticing it. We're not like old people scammers and stuff, right? We yeah. want people to pay us only if they feel comfortable to pay us. That's how we do business. And, and that's a bad way to fight churn. What is a positive way to fight churn is for example, to improve the UX writing, to make it very accessible to unsubscribe from that service. Because I know that one day after maybe six months, I will steal an article from that publisher and I will be like, hey, how about I would subscribe again? But because I know how terrifying the experience of unsubscribing, I know that I would never, ever pay for that service. Mm. I would never. You like, they, they should pay me and I would maybe sign up. So what I'm trying to say is that if I had a positive experience from unsubscribing from them, then I would probably resubscribe again. And that's what people need to learn about UX writing. You need to make positive experiences with the brands you're working with through good communication and good design and positive design. And that's better for business than milking people, squeezing them for, for conversions and so on. You want people to feel comfortable and confident using your products and services and you want to build trust. And once you do that, you'll see that they hooked and they will use your products and services for a very long time, for many years, forever, arguably. Mm -hmm. Some companies, you just pay them forever. Uh, and that's the best, the best business uh, to be in. Yeah. So that's the, uh, that's the long answer, the free brand mm -hmm. for why your product is good, low hanging fruits. Uh, Product-led gr growth and upsells and conversions, reduced churn, number three, and increase retention, that's number two. Yeah, love it. Yeah, it's like those companies that use dark patterns, I don't know, like reversing the colors of like calls to action and making copy confusing just so that people don't do what they don't want them to do, forcing them. And um, yeah, are you sure? Are you yeah. sure do you want to starve your cat? Yeah. <laughs> So buy this cat food right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so speaking of usability, how do you balance though the, like the persuasion aspect of copy with the usability aspect? So that's a good question. 
when you work on the product areas, you make it as usable as possible. You don't think about money at all. You think about how can I make sure that they will use it in the most, in the best possible way. The tone would be around education. So they are inside of your product already. You just want them to keep using it. Let's say you work in a product like Webflow or Framer or HubSpot or like different SaaS products, you name it. You just want people to have an intuitive experience. You want to learn from them what they, what their desires are, what is missing to them, what is great for them. You want to iterate. You want to use the, the design thinking methodology. You want to keep brainstorm and ideate and iterate your prototypes and test it over and over again to improve the user experience because you know that good UX is good for business. And about the persuasion, that's more of a marketing dilemma. That's more for the, like the marketing website. How can I be more persuasive? But the way I say it, and I'm rephrasing here, someone else from our UX writing community, but you, let's say that you have a bike store and your product is bike, bicycle. So you have the sales person of the bike and this person need to talk to you and te teach you about the feature. Then it will tell you, Hey, it can do this and that to make a sale. That's how you attract the lead. But once I have the bike, now I need someone to teach me how to use it in the best way. Let's say it's mountain bikes. So I'm not a mountain biker. Maybe I need a mentor or a guide or a friend or a spouse or a family member that will teach me how to ride my mountain bike. And that would be the, the sales person would be the marketing persuasive person and the friend that will teach you how to use the mountain bike, that will be the UX writer. And those would consider to be, the, those people would use different tone, different methodologies, different ways to communicate with you. Mm. And, and sometimes those could be the same people. Sometimes you, the, the bike, the sales person would have to show you the feature and how it's going to work. And, and, and sometimes the mentor will say to you, Hey, if you like this mountain bike, you probably need a good helmet as well mm -hmm. and make an upsell, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah uh, I think probably a bit more of a mix of like the intersection between persuasion and usability. You will probably see it in, I don't know, like product tour copy or onboarding emails, everything that it's still in the decision-making process for people. So. I'm curious, do you work with the conversion copywriters and how do you advise UX writers to work with conversion copywriters to make sure that the whole experience is consistent? So a lot of times it's the same person in different companies. Uh -huh. So that's not, that's an opening. The same yeah. person that did the persuasion to go in is the same person that's doing the onboarding. Listen, it's writing at the end of the day and good writers could do both. But uh, as a UX writer, I try to come up with some kind of a checklist of things that I know that if that person checked while onboarded to the product, I know that they would probably, there's a, a larger, li bigger likelihood that they will end up using it more constantly. So I try mm -hmm. to think to myself, what is that checklist for each product and what type of uh, task do one person needs to do in order to be hooked? For example, when you set up a LinkedIn account, you have this list of things you need to do. You need to... Yeah. Uh, update your account, you need to follow the first person at your first connection, write your first post, and then there is more likelihood that you'll be hooked or at least you'll be using it on a constant phase. So I try to figure out that stuff. And, and to your question, how does, how do you balance or communicate the marketing to the product itself? So that's to say that good marketing especially for SaaS, is not about trying hard to make a sale, it to present the value. Mm. So if it's a good product, let me give you an example. So we have this project with one company that just, you know, those apps help you to source lead, like uh, Apollo, yeah. give you like, so I worked with this client that is similar to that one, but their uh, unique selling point, their USP, was that they give you unlimited lead. That's the main feature of the SaaS. So the marketing person, you focus on the main feature, on the unique selling point, and you learn also about the product and why this solves a big pain to the client, for example, because some clients use credits, 
and they pay for like 100 bucks for 100 credits and too much money. And they sometimes need maybe 5,000 credits and they don't have the budget for $5,000. So you could say in your marketing stuff, no more credit. Get unlimited leads, right? So you take the feature that is like very unique about your products and services and you make a sale out of it. That's your USP, that's the conversion. Uh, and uh, and when the feature is very positive for the end user, that's a very positive feature, right? And limited lead, who doesn't want that? Uh, it's easier to make a conversion or something. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'm curious about different touch points. So how do we make sure that you are consistent with the UX copy, like between jumping from email onboarding to product copy? And, and also what type of research do you do that informs what you write? That's great. Two different questions. First, in order to create consistent copy, we need to use, first of all, design principles. What is the user journey? How we can communicate our product in the whole user journey from getting that lead to onboarding them to make them use the product. But sometimes there are many different hands working on this project, right? Different features, different teams. It's a big company, 200 people. How can we make consistent writing with 200 people? So that's when the style guide comes in place. When I work with your client for my UX writing agency, we, we tend to make a sale also for that project, which is building a voice and tone style guide for the company. And that comes after the initial writing. Because first of all, you need to write, you need to understand what needs to be written. And then you see what are the patterns, what is the archetype of the user. And based on that, you create a voice and tone style guide, and then you try to make it accessible for the product uh, team. The way we work today, to be honest, using AI, we go to one of the AI agents that exist in the markets these days, and we build a style guide, uh, and we feed that style guide with that agent. So let's say we have a client in the real estate business, and they have hundred different uh, workers in the organization. And uh, we fed the voice and tone style guide that we've built. It took us maybe three, four months to build it after we wrote a lot of parts of the interface. We built the architects. We did the research that was needed to do user interviews. We interviewed people from the team. And uh, sometimes you even go to the sites, the real estate sites to see how they use the app Yeah. Uh, and doing like usability testing. And, and based on that, we took a large chunk of data with all of the style guide. And we fed it to the AI agent, just like uh, GPTs for chat GPT. So if you're familiar with that, now we have this enterprise yeah. GPT that all of the people in the organization could use. And instead of having this document that nobody actually looked at all, uh, we have the agent that you just ask it, Hey, how should I write the headline? Mm -hmm. What are the rules? And give me the rules of writing the headline mm -hmm. and then gives it to you. Or telling to it, I'm writing this and that scenario. Could you please give me some guidelines that will help me with the con UX content of this screen? It's still not perfect. I say it's a four or five out of 10 experience, but I feel mm -hmm. like we'll get there, especially when GPT is getting better. I also don't believe necessarily that GPT is the best way to go. So I'm exploring these days other uh, AI agent tools for that mm -hmm. specific uh, test. But uh, yeah, back to what I said before, I'm trying to always be on the lookout of how can I bring innovation also into my design process. So that's yeah. one example of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm super curious. I'm a nerd for AI as well. And uh, what, what are the other agents that you're trying? Because I know GPTs, but w what are the other ones? I'm trying, for example, one thing that I'm trying with is Gemini 1.5, which I think it's great for having a lot of context so you can feed it up a shit ton of information and you can keep it in memory and remember it. So what are the other things that you're trying? Okay. So talking about AI agents, I'm very happy you brought it up because I could talk about it for another four. Let's keep it short. And yeah. um, we, we need to separate it between the agents that are working on a specific LLM, such as Gemini or such as GPT by ChatGPT. Yeah. Gemini works on the LLM created by Google, and then you must use the Google suite. Same with GPT, you use GPT, then you are all hooked. Open AI. And only on open AI. I like other tools that are still very immature, very early days, newborn tool that 
help you to build agent, but they don't tell you to, they give you the opportunity to connect to all of the LLMs that you could, that exist out there. So one tool that I like is Mind Studio. Mm. You build an agent and then you can connect it to to GPT-4.0 or to Gemini or to Claude or to Llama, which is open source by Facebook. You could connect it to whatever and you can experiment and test. And that's mm. something that I like to do as a designer. Another one is Cody AI. So that's another one. The differences between those two, Mind Studio is more for having an agent that is white labeled and most, mostly operates on the user data. So for example, you can give it some information and then do a system prompt and then it will give you some ideas about stuff. So that's like the way that I think it's most usable compared to Cody in which you can upload the big data sources. Like, I don't know, big PDFs, like a style guide or something like that, and then create an agent on top of that database. Based on my experience, obviously in both tools, you could do either, but that's how I found it the best use cases for me. You can also upload the data set to my studio, but I found it very buggy. So mm. I'm not using it for that. And I'm still on the exploration and lookout for more tools. And every day now you have a new tool. So yeah, I would, I would stay away from looking on the new shiny tool and more about thinking about practicality. So about using an agent, regardless to the company creating that agent, that could operate with different LLMs. I think that's a smart mindset that all of us should mm -hmm. have. And in addition to that, thinking in the agent mindset, it's a, mind, a smart mindset to understand that agents are going to get better. And we need to create solutions for agents that would be secure on our database. And that would be ethical also, and that would be usable because you build agents and sometimes you're like, this piece of shit, I don't need to use it. <laughs> yeah. So that's the type of thing we should, uh, mindset we should have. And, uh, yeah, as I said, I think that AI right now is the three or four out of 10 experience. I think we could get into seven to eight out of 10 experience soon, especially as a UX person, I always explore that, like how can I create better experience with AI? And yeah, we have a course for that also, the AI Design Academy, where I teach people how to use them. Ah, oh, nice. How to use AI tools. I teach Mind Studio. I teach also the no-code automation. It's a bit off-brand of the UX Writing Hub, but I just, mm -hmm. just teach people how to do it because I think it's important. Yeah. Cool. My, my last question is actually about the future. So how do you see the future of UX writing, especially with AI and like voice, for example, one thing that I find very interesting, if there are already a couple of tools, there's one that's called Hume. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's basically like an em empathic kind of AI kind of under understands your emotion, your facial expressions, and you can even use it to browse through a website, like you can take actions, like you can change page. You can say something like, show me like, how much is this SaaS product and, and the AI navigates through the website. So I find it very interesting because then you're having to persuade and work with your copy with the AI rather than the final user in a way, just because the AI becomes the middleman. So how do you see the future of UX writing and writing in general going? Um, I think that robots are going to take over the world and all of us are going to be begging for money on the street while the robot will just have to say, yeah. I'm busy, go away. <laughs> yeah. uh, but until we get there, I think we just have to learn how to use with these tools. I think that we will have to, we would have to incorporate these tools in our day-to-day -day work, obviously what happened until today is going to be different starting from today. Mm. Listen, there are a lot of experiences needed to be created. I don't know if it's the robot, physical robot that create omelette for me, or I don't know if it's voice interaction. I don't know if it's visual interface that needs to be written, but someone needs to create that content. And I feel like AI could help us to create content at scale when done right. Sometimes it's done shitty and then you have also shit, yeah. shit, shitty work at scale, which is a very bad thing. Like all of those people that generate like 100,000 articles to a blog post and then everything is shit. So now we have something terrible yeah. at scale. <laughs> so we don't want to get there. Um, 
just like the example I gave you. Okay. So we had a style guide written down in Google Docs. We shared it with the team and then the team of 50 people said, okay, now what? We're not going to use it. So that's, that was a, a, a problem for us UX writers. Now we can create an agent, feed it with data and people would be like, Hey, how do you write that and that? And it could answer them. So we still need a person that will build this agent. And that person mm -hmm. could be a UX writer. Maybe one day we will have an agent that build this agent and that would be yeah. a <laughs> robot. I don't know. I hope we're still going to have a, war a job. I think we will, but uh, who knows? And yeah, I think that the more stuff the bots and the robots are going to do, the more work we'll have as human think how to build these robots. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, there are a lot of AI tools out there right now. ChatGPT, MidJourney, and maybe 200,000 more tools right now that us humans need to figure out how we could incorporate AI in our digital products without creating pretty experiences. Because now yeah. people hey, are just like, hey, let's, let's add some AI to that. And Why then it offers you to generate a LinkedIn post, and that's a terrible LinkedIn post. So the fact that you can add AI into your product doesn't mean you have to add it only if it creates better user experience. And our work as UX folks is to understand if it's actually creating better UX or if it's not. Yeah. Cool. Amazing. Regardless to the technology, regardless to the technology, yeah. it could be also visual AR glasses. We still need to think at the end of the day, I don't know if someone has Apple pay on their Apple vision pro still people don't want to bump their heads into <laughs> the payment thing. Right. So we, we all the time need to think how we can create better user. Yeah. It always goes back to how do you communicate with humans? Exactly. Yeah. All right. You will thank what you, you so think? much. What do you think? Do you think we did well today? Yeah. I loved it. And uh, yeah, I wish more people actually thought about writing in the, in UX usability terms, just because from my experience, I transitioned to conversion copywriting from doing UX and usability testing uh, at a startup. And I took with me a lot of that, which I find very useful when it comes to understanding both the experience of persuasion and then turning into product copy. So I think more people should actually think of, yeah, the whole experience, not only selling to people, but also having them use the product after you sold them. There's a lot of uh, overlap between these two fields. Yeah. Like a good user yeah. knows how to make conversions, is a good person then. And the conversion person know how to do UX. That's also great skills to have in my opinion. Yeah. Superpowers. All right. Superpowers. Thank you so much. So where can people find you? So the uxwritinghub.com and you also have the podcast Writers in Tech, which is really good. And where can people so find you? I have the you? podcast Writers in Tech. You're going to be a guest on that as well. So check out Chris' nice. episode. Going to be there sometime, anytime soon. I still need to record it. And we ha you can add me on LinkedIn. I have a lot of requests lately. So you can just shoot me an email at y at uxwritinghub.com. And in the near future, I'm going to launch a new podcast named the AI transformation podcast about how big uh, brands incorporate AI into their companies, because I'm curious about that and I'm going to interview industry leaders about it. So that's nice. more or less what's on my plate. Love it. Love it. I will be sure to check it out. Cool. Awesome. Yuval, thank, thank you so much for being here and have a great day. You too, man. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to the pod. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, the best thing you could do to support the show and help me as a small business owner would be to leave a review. Head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and let me know what you think. If you don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe. And if you have any feedback, questions or suggestions for future episodes, just hit me up on LinkedIn at Christopher Silvestri or Twitter at Silvestri Chris. Speak to you next time.